Welcome to Econ Talk, brought to you by the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of George Mason University. My guest today is Larry Anacone, my colleague here at George Mason. Larry is one of the world's authorities on the economics of religion. The economics of religion? What is that? Come on, Larry, help me out here. The economics of religion is a new field that uses the insights and methods of modern economics to analyze the human side of religion. What does that mean? Well, the let human me, side. <laughs> let me emphasize right up what it's not. Okay. Because anytime people hear the word economics, they tend to think of money, and it's important to understand the economics of religion is not primarily uh, about the study of money and religion, about the study of contributions or the pay of pastors or the wealth of the Catholic Church. Those are all things that we pay some attention to, but they are in no sense our primary focus. Um, it's not about the financing of religion. Um, and it's not about using economics to assess or evaluate theology, much less the truth of any one religion relative to another or the truth of religion in general. Um, and so one way of saying this is it's not about any of the things that really interest people about religion. But, but what but, they think is interesting about religion. Because I, I, I want to reassure our listeners that that Larry's insights into this topic are rather uh, extraordinary and fresh and different. And I, I think it's a great way to start by saying the economics of religion is not about what you might think it sounds like the financial part. Although, you're right, people are interested in those things. They're interested in financial scandals in the church. They're interested in pay of directors or board members or uh, pastors or religious leaders. They are also interested in Money, just because money is interesting, but there are a lot of things in, econ in, in the economics of religion that have nothing to do with money, as you say, that are quite interesting. So tell us about tell us okay. about some of those. Uh, of course, I was joking when I said that uh, it isn't about the interesting things. I wouldn't be spending my time uh, on this, and I've spent a great many years now, really 25 or so, thinking about and and doing research on religion and economics. I wouldn't be doing that if I didn't think it was very interesting. But it goes back to what I said at the beginning that it's about the study of the human side of religion. Religion in the real world is about people and the way they interact with each other, the things they believe, the ways they behave, the institutions they form in relation to beliefs, uh, in relation to the supernatural or transcendent values. And the economics of religion, like the sociology of religion, the psychology of religion, and you know, the anthropology of religion, ask questions about why different denominations have different approaches to um, what is required of people, why some religions seem to grow while others are declining, why religion is or is not uh, durable in the face of social changes, why religion captivates so many people in all eras and places and times and, and leads them to do things that they might otherwise not do. In some cases, clearly religion brings out some of the very best in people, in some cases some of the worst. These are interesting and important questions. But you mentioned a bunch of other disciplines, anthropology, psychology, sociology. Those are the disciplines that people usually think of when they think of religion. What's distinctive about the economics approach? The economic approach, uh, to almost quote my our mentor Gary Becker, differs from sociological, psychological, other approaches in its unflinching attention to maximizing behavior, or rational choice on the one hand, to the stability of preferences on the other hand, and the notion of markets and market equilibrium. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, when we see people doing, different people doing different things, and I'll use the example of religion, when I see one person being what someone might think of as a religious fanatic, extremely devout, and another person whose, whose attitudes toward religion are, are moderate to the point of being even you know, uninterested, we don't just say, well, this one has a taste for religion, or this one was brainwashed. 
we assumed that there was some difference that could be captured by prices or costs or their own personal background. Uh, so we don't just attribute religious behavior to either brainwashing or uh, to some kind of inexplicable difference in, in people's tastes and preferences. When we look at people's religious behavior, again, we don't, no matter how strange or deviant it might seem to, to us, we do not assume that, in fact, that behavior is rooted in deviance. We think, well, what is it that makes it rational? Yeah. yeah. We don't think, well, you know, well, these guys are a joint member. People join a cult. Why do they join a cult? Because they're crazy. Why do I join a cult? Because they're ignorant. Why do they join a cult? Because they've been, you know, they've been brainwashed. No, we stop and say, why would a totally rational person join a cult? And what turns out is that when you ask that kind of question, you get all kinds of insights that otherwise you just miss because you start in a lot of these other disciplines with what are basically the wrong assumptions. Where, and to continue to pick on those disciplines for a minute, often, if you're not careful, everything is a special case. Every person is distinct. Every country is distinct. Every community is distinct. You can't explain anything across countries, across time, because there's always some special case. So what economics really specializes in, in, in many ways, along with that unflinching and relentless application of uh, rational choice, trade-offs, and markets, is the belief that there are things that unify human beings across time and place and that there are some generalizations we can make that are powerful. So give it, why don't you tell us what some of those might be in the economics of religion? Uh, sure. You can think about the economics of religion and its insights at sort of three levels. One is the level of households and individuals. The next is the level of congregations and groups. And then finally, the level of what you would call, economists would call markets. Other people would think of as nations, collectivities, uh, mm -hmm. large groups. Uh, let me congregations start of congregations. Yeah, <laughs> the whole denominations, but even more than yeah, that, sure. the whole collection of denominations that make up the religious landscape of a particular region or, or country. Uh, let me start at that, that top level and say that one of the most straightforward but, uh, but interesting and, and useful insights of uh, the economic approach is that it says when you're looking at religions, you ought to think of them as constituting a market where, in effect, each denomination is a separate firm, and they have to compete with each other. And to the extent to which there is religious freedom, the United States is the best example of this, to the extent to which people can choose one religion or another over another, normal economic kind of processes are going to be at work. A religion that is unresponsive to the perceived needs of people is going to tend to decline. A religion that, on the other hand, is more creative and entrepreneurial will tend to do better over time. But there's more than that. As in uh, secular markets for ordinary commodities, in the religious marketplace, more freedom means more innovation, more entrepreneurship, and surprisingly, or perhaps not, depending on your, your viewpoint, in some fundamental sense, more and better religion. Uh, and, and I'm saying that in part giving you a very modern twist, but in part uh, I'm, I'm hearkening back to something that Adam Smith wrote about in The Wealth of Nations uh, over 200 years ago. That's one of the primary insights, and it has been so influential in the last 15, 20 years since economists and sociologists began to pick up on it that sociologists now talk about that approach, basically what, they, what you can call the religious economies or the religious market perspective, as a new paradigm for the whole social scientific study of religion. So when you use the word market, you're not using it in the sense that some people might use it in the sense of everyday language, or you, there's a farmer's market or the stock exchange. You're talking about the interaction of buyers and sellers across geography, across space, uh, in this case, churches and congregations, synagogues, mosques, trying to attract adherents in competition with each other, and even though there are no formal prices, the way we might talk about the price of an apple, somehow this complex interaction uh, between institutions and individuals leads to outcomes that are more pleasing for those consumers, those constituents, those adherents, when there is competition and freedom than in a case where there might be less freedom and, and less competition. So in, in the actual case of, of religion, you, you mentioned the United States as an example of freedom. Give me, give me a market that's, that's, less con, that's less free, that's more constrained. Um, it's easiest when talking to other Americans and Westerners to talk in terms of religious history of Europe. Mm -hmm. Throughout Europe, 
in uh, the Middle Ages, but even up until really the 20th century, most countries were characterized by one state church. In the north and northern Europe, there was usually one Protestant church, which was the official state religion, the Church of England, the Church of Sweden, uh, the uh, Calvinist you know, Church uh, of uh, uh, you know, Holland or something like that. And within that country, that one church either enjoyed a total monopoly, so much so that it was illegal to be a member of another church, or at least it enjoyed all kinds of favors, subsidies, government support. And if you were not a church, a member of that church, if you instead were worshiping in some other church, you might find yourself actively persecuted. Now, in the United States, in, the, in Europe today, we have only the vestiges of that, but the vestiges remain very powerful. You're not going to be thrown in jail for not being a member of the Church of England or the Church of Sweden or something like that. But you might find still that uh, if you're a member of another church, especially if you're a pastor or a leader, you're going to hit all kinds of regulatory burdens. You're trying to set up a congregation, especially if you're, say, a Jehovah's Witness, some unusual group, it might take you 10, 20, 30 years just to get the right to build a building. There might be all kinds of restrictions on the kind of publications you can do. And, of course, it's even more dramatic in the Islamic world, where you can be thrown into jail for uh, trying to make converts or, or, or worse. So in terms of economic jargon, we call that barriers to entry, right? <laughs> very high barriers. Right, very, well, that's an extreme case. I was referring more to the, 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 other, yes. uh, the other examples, uh, the European examples, where it's just more costly. It's, it's legal. It can be done, but it's it's more costly. And um, so, so in the state, in the extreme case where there's a state monopoly, uh, it's kind of like um, the it's, post office. It's kind of like the post right? office. So our public. intuition in the post office is, is that if if you outlaw competition, you don't get very good service. Now, it, it, can that seemingly uh, a bizarre analogy carry through to these religious monopolies? What are some of the measures we have? that in these situations where there's a state monopoly, uh, somehow it's not working as well for the customer compared to a free society. As it turns out, I did research on this some years ago and looked at different measures of religious activity, mm -hmm. religiosity on the one hand, and religious regulation on the other hand, across countries. And what I found was that if you looked at surveys that tried to assess how religious people were, and in particular you looked at rates of church attendance, or the fraction of the population who said they believed in God, or because these were mostly Christian nations, the, believed in the, the truth of the Bible, or that Jesus was really their savior, or something like that. When you looked at those numbers and compared them to the level of regulation of religions, or the, the extent to which one religion dominated the, the marketplace, and that one religion was, was a state-supported religion, you got this very striking inverse relationship. In other words, the countries that were most religiously free, and we would say as economists competitive, sociologists and others might say pluralistic, mm -hmm. those countries had the highest rates of church attendance, they had the highest rates of belief. Across the board, they were the most religiously active, vital, and the United States was right up at the top. When you went to the opposite extreme and you looked at countries where everyone was almost forced to be a member of a particular church, and the Scandinavian countries until quite recently fit this model almost perfectly, where the church itself was a government, not just a government uh, monopoly, but, but a actual a uh, portion of the state where the ministers were civil servants, uh, then what you got was extraordinarily low levels of religious attendance, religious belief, and Sweden was one of the best examples where the church was basically a branch of government, and everybody is officially in a, mem a member of the church, but the actual fraction of Swedes who go to the Church of Sweden in any given week was maybe 3% as opposed to 30 or 40% of Americans going to church in a typical week. And the pattern worked, you know, for all across the spectrum. The countries that were more toward the middle with moderate levels of regulation had more moderate levels of religiosity. So basically, your, your post office analogy and public school analogy is right on target. When the government runs the business and especially when the government runs other people out of the business or, or diminishes 
con competition, you got less religiosity no matter how you measured it. Do we have any evidence over time? You, this was a study, I assume, that took place, you said, across right. it was a point in time across countries. 1960s, 1970s. Across country study. But do we have any, any ideas? Obviously, it's hard to measure some of these things, but do we have any idea about these changes taking place over time as a, as a particular nation might become more competitive or less competitive over time? Yeah, we have actually very good data on that. And once again, the United States is the best uh, source of data. Uh, the way to real think about the United States is that it's the world's first large-scale experiment in free market religion. Mm -hmm. And starting, in essence, uh, with the Constitution, in some respects starting even earlier than that, sure. uh, the United States officially makes, by virtue of the First Amendment, makes it, it illegal to establish any one church to grant preferences to any one religion or uh, to prevent people from uh, engaging in, in the, the religion of their choice. So we have what we call the Establishment Clause uh, that prevents us from having a state church, state monopoly, and we have the uh, Free Exercise Clause that guarantees that people have the right to, uh, to form whatever religious associations they want. At the time this was passed, most colonies had a state church uh, or a, a colonial church. They had their own established church, so it wasn't true that religious freedom was the norm. Uh, many of those colonies and many of the intellectuals of the time predicted that once you got rid of those state churches that mandated people belong to, you know, that people in Massachusetts be Congregationalists or that, uh, that people in Virginia be members of the Church of England, once you got rid of that, people would just walk away from, from the church and there'd be this, you know, great collapse in religiosity. What happened was the, actually the opposite. And what we had was what historians refer to as great uh, awakenings, great revivals. And what the numbers show is that the established churches, sure enough, did less well. Because yeah. <laughs> they were like a post office, right, they fat, lazy, and not, they didn't know anything about how to deal with, with a wide open market. But the Baptists insulated. and the Methodists and all these small new upstarts, they grew like gangbusters, and they didn't just steal members from existing churches. They were making converts all over America. So to put it in simple numbers, around the time of the Revolution, it appears that about 13% of the population were members of churches. By 1850, something like 70 years later, the number was closer to 30 or 40 percent of the population. And today, it's closer to 60 or 70 percent of the population. We've had fairly steady growth, at least up through the beginning of the 20th century, and maybe right through the present, we've had fairly steady growth in the number of people who are religiously active in the United States as levels of religious freedom, and therefore levels of religious competition, have increased. You said you said numbers, but you meant proportion as Excuse well, me, not just percentages. You meant, yeah, percentages, yes. Because you're controlling for population growth over time, yes. I assume. So in this worldview, which you're, not surprisingly, Larry, I'm quite uh, friendly toward this, this economic perspective. Essentially, you're 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 arguing that. People make choices, just like they make choices everywhere else. They look for what gives them the most satisfaction, the most value, the most quality for the money that they that they put forward. And they're choosing, which is really the essence of the economic worldview, uh, and then how those choices get aggregated. Uh, they're choosing. And some people argue, uh, we know some of them here on in our departments, some of them argue that, well, you can't talk about rational choice. I mean... Religion, by definition, is irrational. I mean, faith is just fundamentally outside the domain of rationality. So it, it, there's something oxymoronic about using the tools of economics, which are fundamentally about careful choice, or at least assuming people acting carefully. When in fact, econ religion is fundamentally about ecstasy and and the transcendent and the divine. These things are fundamentally outside the realm of, of reason, and therefore economics shouldn't really does can't really talk about these things? It's a good question. It's one that has been thrown in my face for perhaps 25 years. Lucky you. And it's one that I essentially chose to, to get myself you know, entangled in by choosing to study religion. Let me say that, number one, abstract arguments about the usefulness of rationality strike me as incredibly unuseful. 
And I say this just based on, on personal experience. After 100 or more, and maybe 200, such debates, many of them public uh, at conferences, uh, many of them at workshops, others of them in writing, I'm not sure that I've ever seen anything useful come out of the abstract <laughs> discussion of what must in principle work. Right. So let's just turn to the pragmatic side. And let me start by turning away from religion for a second to areas that I know are near and dear to you and most other e uh, economists around here. The same claim about the uselessness, the theoretical uselessness of economic approaches has been used to tell us that the economics of the family couldn't possibly be a meaningful field, that economics can't tell us something useful about addiction, can't really tell us anything much about politics, because passion and power and other things are more central. You go down this long list, and what the list turns out to be is basically the list of Nobel Prizes in economics over the last 20, 30 years. In one area after another, economists have looked at areas that were traditionally not studied using economic principles, and in particular the principle of rationality, they've discovered that if they did apply those principles, you'd get all kinds of incredible new insights. And so we have whole fields, whether it's the economics of family or public choice, crime. politics, crime, addiction, you name it. So just on the face of it, I've got to say that that argument doesn't wash very well. And then when you turn to religion, well, you've got more than just the theory, again, of, or, or the experience of the last 20, 30 years. You find that certain ideas have been very profitable. We, we've been talking about the idea of a religious market and religious freedom leading to more and, and perhaps even better religion. Well, the thing to realize is that idea is the exact opposite of what many sociologists were emphasizing for almost 100 years. For almost 100 years, on the basis of their own kind of logic, they argued that a free market, they didn't use that term, but an open religious environment would result in tremendous pluralism, lots of different religions, and people would look at those, those many different religions and decide, oh, there's nothing to it. They'd walk away because in the face of all of these different religions, people would basically lose their faith. Well, it's not a bad theory. It's, it's just wrong. Yeah, it's an interesting theory. Yeah. It's just wrong. It doesn't coincide with the evidence. And but. so here's a case where the economic theory comes along and it turns everything on its head and it has the mild advantage of being right. Uh, here, here. Uh, I could give you uh, a lot of other examples of economic insights which on the surface seem maybe a little far-fetched. When you look closer, you find, wow, that in fact gives us some real insight into why people join cults. And, and one of the things I studied early on was religious extremism, partly because it seemed so irrational to everybody. And so my thinking was that if I could explain using the tools of economics why people joined apparently crazy cults, well, then the Presbyterian Church would be a piece of cake. <laughs> So tell us about that, that research, actually. I'm very interested in that. I think a lot of people do have the view that cult, so it, the word itself is a loaded word. Uh, let, let's call it uh, maybe non-mainstream sects, um, non-mainstream groups of religion, religious practice. Uh, m most people associate those with um, Jonestown, uh, people drinking Kool-Aid off the deep end, um, doing crazy things, uh, being abducted, being brainwashed, uh, uh, the, the whole uh, Waco fiasco was an example, I think, in many people's minds of that. Here was a group that was that was so wacky that obviously they were they were crazy, they were rational. It was just something we had to just be afraid of. But what, what did you find? Well, you've done a good job in summarizing standard popular perceptions, which have been reinforced dramatically by media images, whole movies, and the only problem is the images are wrong in almost every aspect. And here, uh, since I've been a bit picking a bit, uh, picking on sociologists a bit, I, I should perhaps go the other way and say sociologists... You don't have to. They're, they're listening. They're, they're also, <laughs> go right ahead. They're, they're, I don't know what they're doing, in but they, they don't know ahead. Be, in be fairness to sociologists, I have to say that they did a masterful job in the 1970s and 80s of actually going into so-called cults, what, you, what, what might better be called sectarian groups, or simply 
non-standard, non-traditional religious groups, going into these groups and looking at what they were actually doing, tallying up surveys, keeping track of them over time, doing a lot of very, very careful research. And at the same time that psychologists were going in and giving tests to these people, trying to find out whether they were really neurotic, psychotic, or what their uh, you know, intellectual and uh, temperamental backgrounds were. And what those folks found was that by almost every measure, the vast majority of so-called cult members were normal in every respect. They were not, they were not on average poorly educated and ignorant. In fact, the typical 1970s... They're not zombies? <laughs> the They're typical, not being controlled by uh, drugs and, and thought, thought police or whatever they... I don't know how they do in a cult, but... Let's simply say no more than the rest oh, of us. That's a good answer, yeah. No, almost all of the statements, uh, the sensational statements, were wrong. These guys were on av- and gals were on average uh, young, reasonably well educated, healthy. They were normal. They, it, before they joined the groups, they tended to have fairly normal backgrounds. Many of them, most of them, left after a fairly short amount of time and were none the worse for wear. I compare it uh, the 1970s kind of cult craze uh, as. Um, uh, sort of an extension of the 1960s where you had lots of young people who were relatively wealthy and, you know, they they either break up their college uh, experience with a year backpacking across Europe or maybe they join a cult for a little while uh, and, you know, and then they go back to normal life. That makes it sound trivial. There were those kind of people for whom it was just a lark and certainly it did them no, no great damage. There were many other people who became devout and stayed devout. The thing to understand about them is the the product of their devotion tended to be quite good. They were very philanthropic. They worked hard for the group. Um, and, and let me switch here now to the economic insights. Uh, I will, you know, I'm just going to let it stand as a claim that you can search over hundreds of very carefully well-documented studies of so-called cults, and you will find very, very, very few examples of extreme deviance. And the few cases of violence turn out to be cases where the government intervenes in a very overt and heavy-handed way and, frankly, causes a blow-up. We can talk about that more in a moment if you want to, but the Jonestown case and the Waco case are very much examples of how heavy-handed sudden government intervention can throw a cohesive group into into disarray and cause it to react very, very violently. But there's very little evidence that absent that outside force, you would have seen that kind of violence. Let me go back to what's going on here in the economic insights. What's going on here is that there are a lot of things that people value that can only be produced in groups. And not just any old group, groups that are highly committed one to another, groups that are very cohesive. Economists appreciate that that kind of a group is subject to what we call free rider problems. It's if you form a commune where the motto is everyone gets resources in proportion to their needs, whether or not they've been productive, that kind of a group tends to attract freeloaders, people who come, they come for the food, they come for the love, they come for the attention. But when it comes time to even wash the dishes, they're gone. Or they don't feel well that day. They don't feel well that day. Or somehow they just move slower than everyone else. Well, I wish this were just true of the occasional, you know, uh, commune. It's it's true, as you and I know, of the typical economics department. Uh, It's true of all... Larry, don't don't let on. Every human collective. It turns out that the very things that we think of as extremism, the very things that make a group seem rather deviant, work to maintain very high levels of commitment and cohesiveness. And so one way of saying it is simply this, that the things that we associate with sectarianism make it possible for those sects to produce real goods and services that the rest of us can't get. Because we're outside the group. Because we're outside the group, and we're not a part of any similar group. People who join those groups, perfectly rational people, will go into those groups because they're getting benefits that they would otherwise not get. Even though they're going to bear costs, which are often very visible, of membership uh, in order to gain those, 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 those benefits. It's a trade-off. It's like, being on a, it's like being on a really good sports team. You have to put up with a lot of demands. 
And to create a really good sports team, or for that matter, a really good academic department, you need to do two things. You need to screen out people who are not very dedicated or very capable, and you also have to keep the people in the group in line. And it turns out that one way of doing that is to demand very costly sacrifices to even be a part of the group. That are observable, presumably, so that compliance can be monitored at a relatively low cost as well. That's the so problem. Give, give me an yeah. example from the sect. Uh, okay. Let's keep calling them cults because I think it's a, it's a little bit easier to, to say and, our, and our, our, our listeners will understand what we're talking about rather than talking about sex and sectarian behavior. So cult behavior or um, – until, let's call it. I was like, well, let's keep calling it cults, but I think the examples here we're talking about are intense mm -hmm. religious experience uh, that, that somehow strike outsiders as deviant, abnormal, weird, or wacky. Let me give us some examples of how that works to restrain the, that free rider problem, okay. and, and what some of the benefits are. Yeah. Because I think people who aren't in those communities uh, don't see any benefits. They see what appear to be on the outside. On the outside, appear to be robotic this zombie-like thing of people following the will of a leader, and yet uh, somehow, if they're staying there, obviously they're being brainwashed or coerced, etc. But you're taking a different perspective. Yeah. So. Well, let's be clear about the kind of behavior we're talking about. A, uh, a so-called cult will very often regulate what you wear. And so you wear clothing that, that marks you as different, right? Right from the get-go. It's a black, you wear a black robe or a pink robe or how you groom yourself. You shave your head or you grow your hair real long. Uh, or your sexual conduct. Uh, it's either, you know, sex with no one or uh, sex with a great many different people, which is more rare but, but not unheard of in, in certain cults. What you eat, uh, you, you stay away from pork or you stay away from vegetables or you eat nothing but vegetables. Uh, Along almost every dimension of life, you can find a, a cult that has made some kind of prohi prohibition. And as you pointed out a second ago, what tends to be important about those prohi prohibitions is that they're very visible. You can tell at an instant whether or not somebody is complying. It's much harder to tell at an instant whether a person is working as hard as they should or putting their true heart and soul into a group. If we could directly measure how hard they were working, how committed they were, we wouldn't need these external factors. But look at what an external factor, simply one that says you have to shave your head, you have to wear a pink robe, and you have to go around chanting quite regularly, which I'm describing basically the Hare Krishna group, uh, which was quite popular uh, and very visible in the 1970s. Everybody looked at them, they thought, this is weird. Sure. And what's going on here? Well, the Hare Krishnas, by enforcing this rule, immediately avoid the problem of having people join the group who are half-hearted. Because... <laughs> yeah, no doubt about that. That's right. That's so pretty straightforward there. So you screen out the half-hearted people because nobody is going to, to subject themselves to this cost if they just are mildly interested in what the Krishnas are doing. And so you immediately create a big and important and visible distinction between the real members and uh, the half-hearted uh, outsiders. Now, why is that important? Well, you've got limited resources, limited money, limited energy. You want to bestow it upon the other members of the group. Well, you don't want to have, to have confusion about who those members are. And you I mean, don't want people free riding who pull down the resources without contributing to the cohesiveness yeah. of the community. Right, and you don't want somebody to be able to show up one day take a bunch of resources in, and then leave tomorrow and go off and do their regular everyday job. Well, you can be sure that if you're wearing pink robes and shaving your head and going around chanting, that you're not going to be able to even get a normal job, let alone hold it down. So I'm forcing you to give up all kinds of benefits in the normal secular world in return for being a recognized, solid member of the group. It, good marketing, too, by the way, right? It's, it's a clear, identifiable uh, uh, sign. It's like a uniform. But, but here's my, my question. And it's fascinating to, to take that perspective, and I think it, it's very different, again, from the obvious standard ways we read about these people in the in the media. So what are they getting in return? So you've talked about – it's obvious what the sacrifices are, and, and of course we're going well beyond so-called cults to mainstream religion now. People who are devout members of, of of a particular faith often make the kind of sacrifices you're talking about in the name of religious observance. It's not just the clothing. It goes to all kinds of things, the diet – uh, the behavior, the use of money and, and limits on that, all kinds of lifestyle and practical restraints that people impose on themselves, which would seem to be irrational, right? According to the narrow uh, 
economist perspective. The narrow economist perspective is people act in their own self-interest. Why would you ever rationally uh, give up something? Uh, by definition, you're restraining yourself, you're, you're reducing your, your well-being, and yet you argue the opposite. We are talking about what I have called in my writing sacrifice and stigma, the willing giving up of things that you otherwise could consume, sacrifice, the undertaking of actions, behaviors, lifestyles that all but invite other people to regard you as strange and be less willing to interact with you. Sacrifice and stigma. It would be irrational in the economic sense, to do this if you were doing it on your own. It never makes sense in an economic context for me, a perfectly rational person, to take a resource and just burn it up. But in a group context, strange as it may seem, this can be efficient. Because the issue is not that I alone am imposing a sacrifice on myself, but rather we all are. And what we are doing in the process is separating ourselves from the rest of the world, pushing aside certain temptations in the sense of things that we would otherwise do that would undermine the group. And what are we getting? That's your question. It's a very good question. Well, the fact of the matter is that a tremendous amount of what humans value can only be produced in groups. Some of those things are abstract, like love and concern. They they matter tremendously. We have biological research that if children uh, and especially infants aren't loved and held and cared for, they just basically don't grow up human. Uh, Primates don't even grow up primates. Uh, So some of it is very abstract, but some of it is quite concrete. There are times that I need help from other people, and there are times that I can help other people. And if I'm acting in my narrow self-interest, apart from some kind of very elaborate contract, that help just isn't going to happen. But if I'm in a group uh, that has high levels of mutual commitment, then when I'm in need, other people are going to help me, whether or not we've specified a contract of what exactly the help is and what exactly people are going to want to do. I watch this, and anyone can watch this, with a group that, that's fairly mainstream, the Mormons. Uh, if, if you're a Mormon and you, you, know, you or your spouse has a child, other Mormons just you know, normally come and provide you with meals for the next week or two because it's understood that that is what the group does. If you're moving... Also also happens in the Jewish community. Yes, it happens in one group after another. I was just naming one particular. But uh, the cohesive, distinctive, you know, in quotes, cult-like groups, all are striking in that they help each other on a day-to-day basis in ways that outsiders... uh, don't find necessarily strange. They just don't do, that and they find it hard to. But to that get. example you gave is an interesting one. Uh, couldn't I just get takeout? I mean, you, you give me an example where people are uh, making these sacrifices, and in return they get free food. It's got to be more than that. It's much more than that. Food is an important part of community. It, but I like that example. I want to come back to it. The reason, the reason I like that example, though, even though I'm just I'm critiquing it for, for a second, I... You know, there's this this complaint about American life that there's no more there's no sense of community. We're bowling alone. We're all sitting at our computer terminals, uh, surfing for uh, uh, minutia and living these empty, meaningless lives. And yet, in religious communities, there's obviously a tremendous amount of community. Not in the just in the literal sense that you see the same groups of people again and again, but that you are uh, sharing with them and receiving a set of of benefits that is more than just the food itself. It's not just the material uh, insurance policy here or benefit of being taken care of by the community. Something more transcendent, I assume. Absolutely. The thing that makes religion distinctive is, of course, this transcendent and supernatural element. The danger and the error in thinking about religions that is most commonly made by intellectuals, especially intellectuals who have no personal religiosity, is that it's just about the supernatural. I think it's important to understand that ideas have power in everyday life. Ideas about the supernatural, beliefs about the nature of God, about what is good and moral and proper and obligatory, interact with the way we actually behave. And so... Helping somebody with a meal 
even when it may not be in some technical or narrow sense efficient, may be in fact tremendously useful in building up group cohesiveness. And as I say, there are all kinds of things that you can't write contracts for. There, there are all kinds of things that you can't get out of the market. Well, being have, uh, receiving affection would be uh, is one of those things, right? Receiving Feeling love <laughs> is not something you, you can't. You, you can buy things that look like love, but you can't buy the real thing. The real no. thing can only be uh, given and received. And if you try to sell love, you will find that most people don't want to buy because they don't believe they're going to be getting real love. Uh, there is this striking interaction between what we could call material and spiritual or material and social goods. And religions that are most successful bind them together and use them in a mutually reinforcing way. So we get together and we enjoy food together. But it's not primarily about eating and ingesting calories. For you know, the few members who are actually uh, at the edge uh, financially, the food might be really quite important. But for the rest of us, it's primarily about interacting with people, enjoying each other's company, and uh, being there for them and vice versa. And that's not something that you can make happen overnight. It's, these are, you know, it's an extension of family, and everybody knows that a family which decides early on that, well, it's much more efficient for each of us to go to McDonald's at different times of day rather than take the time to have a meal together, that family suffers not primarily in lack of calories, or they spend too much money because they don't get to buy the jumbo fries and yeah. share it. The real cost is they're not as much of a family. Yeah. <laughs> they don't have the tough. same level of love and commitment. And that translates to loss of all kinds of other things when there are deeper and more profound needs uh, that, that yeah. you, know, you can't cover. Uh, and you see this. Nobody, the elderly in America overwhelmingly despise the notion of being taken off to rest homes, no matter how well appointed those homes are in goods and services. Because what they really are desperate for in most cases is the kind, kind of affection and trusting, uh, open-ended uh, relationship that you get from people who have a absolute tie to you that isn't a part of financial transactions. There are certain things you can't buy. Religions excel at providing the things that you can't buy. And the more dysfunctional the economy, by the way, and the more dysfunctional the government, the more, those, the more such things there are. And so that's one reason why we see more of these cult-like groups where, the, where civil society, the economy, and government are, are so dysfunctional. These, these kind of groups provide collective resources of all sorts. I find this, you know, I find this point very compelling and uh, and persuasive. But I wonder what a skeptic would say. Uh, one thing a skeptic might say is it's a little bit tautological. You've got these people. I'm a big believer in tautologies, by the way. I think they can be very powerful. But let, let's let's give the skeptic uh, uh, the airtime. The skeptic would say, well, you know, you see these people making a sacrifice, so you just assume that there's some benefit, and you've given it a name: cohesiveness or feeling a member of the group. Now. We all know as individuals out there and, and who are listening now and, and ourselves, you, you and I, Larry, that we do feel parts of various groups in, in an emotional way. It's not just, boy, I'm glad I'm in this group in case something happens to me, I'll be taken care of. We, we do feel something transcendent uh, in the groups that we're in. And, and I, I would argue that many religious groups, that transcendence is, is hard to produce with other kinds of groups that are, that are not dealing with the, with the, the divine or the transcendent, that, that it would be difficult to get that same feeling from a book club, say, or a bowling group or a poker uh, club with your friends. But is there, do you have any evidence on these, of this claim? Is there, I mean, it's a tough claim to test. I'm not sure it's testable. It is a tough, but I... Oh, I, like what, I like your example of the elderly. You mm -hmm. know, I, there, there are certain situations where, in times of, of as you say, of great stress or, or uh, dire situations where you actually can measure some of the interactions that are taking place and, and see that functionality in these groups. I don't want to make it sound as though religion only functions for people who are especially needy, but by looking at people who we know to be, on average, somewhat more in need, but no less rational than the rest of us, we get an indirect test of this hypothesis. The elderly, 
I, I think most people will agree on average, aren't less rational than the rest of us, but they have certain kinds of needs that the rest of us tend not to have. At the other end of the spectrum, the young uh, tend not to be terribly irrational, although they, they may yet be not very well educated, but they have a great many needs. Religions, as this sort of uh, theory would predict, excel at providing resources for the young and, and the old. And they don't just do it you know, in casual and direct ways. They create institutions. Religions historically have been major providers of rest homes and major providers of uh, norms that tell individuals and groups they should be taking care of, of the elderly. And they've been major providers of childhood education, orphanages, uh, and any number of other services and, aimed at, at the youth. And, and of course, the, and, everybody in between. And those norms and how to be a good parent and what's expected of a parent. Parenting is an interesting example. Religion demands things of parents that, that our secular society has trouble demanding of, of us as parents. And um, there's a tremendous free rider problem in a, potentially in a family where parents want to do what they want to do and ignore the can ignore the interests of their children, or, or not ignore, but trade off for their own benefit versus the benefit of their children. And religion is one way that those incentives are, are changed. Yeah, I see religions as operating both by providing you direct group support. So as a parent, you know that the congregation will actually help you raise your children. And an indirect support helping you keep yourself in line. And here I'm deviating a little bit from the strict economic notion that we are perfectly rational. Insofar as people know that they are not always perfectly rational or that they're going to make decisions that benefit them in the short run but not the right. long run. Temptation, we call uh, that. It, religions are very clear. They have a very extensive vocabulary for this sort of thing. Uh, temptation is one of the main words. We look for institutions and groups to help keep us in line. And another concrete example of this are groups, uh, self-help groups, such as Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, self-help groups uh, are not always religiously oriented, but to a remarkable degree, they have a kind of religious dimension to them. Even when they avoid having being tied to any one particular faith or de denomination, they are constantly invoking transcendent principles to help maintain a group, which in turn is helping people with very concrete problems. And so Alcoholics Anonymous is a great example. And uh, on the surface, Alcoholics Anonymous is purely secular. You look a little more closely, and it's imbued with, with notions of spirituality. And yet what it's really all about is helping people get, you know, get, get on the wagon you know, yeah. and getting them sober and keeping them sober. It's a very concrete, uh, very human goal, which is being pursued through groups that are being bound together in part by their religious dimension. There are countless other ways in which religious groups and quasi-religious groups provide people with both concrete and abstract services. And those of us who are on the outside and don't, don't understand this look, and we just, we just see the religion as either some un, unnecessary bit of fluff or, or, you know, it's downright pernicious. We just don't see what's really going on. And so we fall back on these notions of irrationality and brainwashing. Well, it's a really interesting set of insights, let me um, take it in a slightly different direction. Sure. Uh, there are people, and I'm really fascinated by this idea of these cohesive benefits, which, again, I think they're hard to describe, but I would describe them as um, shared goals with others that that are transcendent, either self-improvement or group uh, activities that are that create a feeling that is hard to produce outside of a football stadium. And I, and I say that tongue in cheek, but actually, I think being a football fan uh, is a very interesting example of where you have this tremendous feeling of cohesiveness. Uh, you wear the goofy clothes. Uh, you have a regular Sunday or Saturday activity, and uh, there is an emotion for a, for a serious sports fan. There is an emotional high that is produced that is hard to produce in other ways. Now, uh, I'm both religious and a sports fanatic, and I make a distinction between uh, a 
the high I get from sports and the high I get from religion because I do realize that the high I get from sports is kind of empty. Uh, it's it's not transcendent. It's part of a zero sum game where it, it inevitably involves other suffering on the other side of the uh, of the stadium. So, uh, and yet I think again for those in our listening audience who are not religious who are, who are interested in this conversation, there are many parts of our life where we feel this part of of group identity. We understand it can be dangerous. Um, there, there are lots of people throughout history who have harnessed that that intense feeling of being part of a group. We also understand there are people who don't enjoy that. They don't want to be part of a group. Uh, they don't have a taste for it. They're different. Uh, presumably people differ by how much they're attracted to and, and how much they are unattracted to this concept. So uh, let, let me pose the, the following strange idea. L- let me suggest that atheists uh, or people who are openly hostile to religion, not just non-believers, but people who are hostile to religion, don't enjoy this group feeling and, and can't uh, – can't understand why people would want to cons- consume this so-called cohesiveness thing, this in- transcendent, difficult to identify, uh, difficult to measure phenomenon. So it's not just that, that they're not sure how to measure it; they don't think it exists. I'm sure there, we have listeners who, who feel that way. The, some of those folks then look at people who follow religion as being not just, oh, they're different from me, I like vanilla, they like chocolate, I like classical music, they like jazz, but rather they're irrational, Uh, they're ignorant, they're uneducated. And I know you've done some work on this. I'd like you to talk for a minute about the evidence we have for practitioners of mainstream religion or cults uh, as to their their characteristics. Because I think there's a widespread view, particularly among intellectual and educated people, that these folks who are in these communities, uh, be they um, cultish or mainstream, there's something wrong with them. Uh, you know, there's something flawed. They're, they've got a hole in there. It's a crutch. Uh, obviously, there's something peculiar about them. They never really got. They sucked. They got sucked into this this comforting belief about God, and therefore, uh, they're just. It just. It's like any other crutch. What, what evidence do we have that? people who do find this cohesiveness attractive, people who are participants in religious communities, what are their attributes relative to the rest of the, you know, the, rest of the population, the sort of so-called non-participants? Well, first Long thing, enough question for you? Sorry about that. Yeah, <laughs> that's all right. Sorry. My answers are even longer. Go, go <laughs> for it. Academics do this. Number one, you said compared to the rest of the population, you've got to start out with the realization that it's the religious people who are the norm, the irreligious people who are the, are the exceptions. But of course, if you're a skeptic or an atheist, that's comfort, because then you can just—it's—it's it's, it's a distinctiveness. But Fine. it's a good point. It's Fine. a good point. <laughs> but you don't want to—you—you you want to be clear that when you're an atheist talking about these deviant, ignorant, brainwashed, misguided, so on people that you are talking about between. 70 and 90 percent of the population. Well, okay? I, I have to interrupt, though, as part apology, and then I'll let you give your longer answer. We both have many friends who are not religious, who are atheists, who are hostile to religion, who are respectful of, of people's personal beliefs and activities, etc. So I don't want to lump uh, all non religious people into some uh, disdainful group. Many of them are not disdainful, they're quite respectful, uh, and I, I just want to say that up front. But many are disdainful. And, 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 and those are the ones I want to talk about. Okay, fine. My point is simply this, that the first thing to recognize about religious people is that they constitute a majority of almost every population in human history, with the possible exception of some portions of contemporary Northern Europe. Uh-huh, interesting. And so intellectuals who were irreligious, if not actively atheistic, and who have shaped our thinking, even that uh, of quite religious people, in the West over the past 200 years, have foisted uh, a series of misperceptions on us, whether deliberately or accidentally. They've made us think that, at least in modern, well-educated, technologically advanced societies, irreligion is the norm. And it, it, as long as you start with that assumption, it's natural to then say, well, these religious people, what is it that makes them so weird? Mm-hmm. If, in fact, it's irreligion that, that's the norm, 
then one of the things you should be asking yourself is what makes people so, you know, what makes for these weird atheists? Now, I'm not saying they are yeah, weird. I mean, again, I'm not a, saying they a, are weird. As an actively religious person, I, I wouldn't want to assume that everyone who's not but, religious but my does point some, is, something wrong with them. But my it's point is thought. that uh, there is a tendency among irreligious people to view themselves as the benchmark against which the rest of the world should be somehow measured. And I'm saying that just as a statistical matter, it's important to recognize the vast majority of people, if you're an economist, the vast majority of people is important because you believe that most people are pretty rational. Those people who you, in your normal models of consumption of apples and oranges and automobiles, who you insist are being rational, those are the same people who are going to church. Yeah, sure. Okay? Uh, so that, that's just my first point. My second point is that when you actually do psychological profiles of religious people, when you look at their demographic characteristics, and let's talk about religious people in general, people who say, if they're Americans, uh, yes, I, I believe in God, yes, I go to religious services with some regularity, and yes, if, if they come out of a Christian tradition, I believe the Bible is the word of God, I believe Jesus is the savior of the world. If they come out of a Jewish tradition, they would answer those questions a little differently. It would be the Hebrew Bible they were talking about, certain kind of observances, Islam different. But clearly, it's not all that hard to identify, uh, by means of survey, people who describe themselves as religious and then to turn around and see what they look like in terms of their actual attributes. Well, they turn out to be about as educated as everybody else, about as wealthy as everybody else, psychologically normal when you give them tests of neuroticism and so on. The differences between them and the less religious people are relatively small. That's one way of looking when at it. You say it. relatively small, and you say, well, you know, they're, they're equally well-educated, they're equally well-off financially. You said about. Is it... Yeah, are there differences? Are they not? Are they systematic? Is it small? Is it large? Um, any two things that are not identical are different, and the difference is statistically significant. <laughs> there always are going to be differences. You're asking me whether the differences are large, yeah. substantial, and meaningful. Do you have some and, levels to, you can talk about off the top of your head? We can, uh, we can also send our readers, our listeners, to, yeah. to uh, some to some printed printed material as well. But let me say that if you want to go and actually look at some data, but not devote a great deal of time to it, there is a website called the Arda, T-H-E-A-R-D-A dot com, which will allow you, at a, a push of the button, to actually analyze data from standard surveys and, and almost instantly know what the results are rather than what somebody says about the results. Almost in a moment, look at a national survey or a whole series of national surveys and compare religious to non-religious people in terms of levels of education. We'll, we'll put a link up okay. to that site up on the Econ Talk okay. website. Great, great resource for people who don't want to just you know, know what other people for, yeah. are saying. Um, what you find is that there is a small but statistically significant positive association between religiosity and education. In English, as, if you, as you go across the population and look at people who are more educated, as you go from uh, only eighth grade education up to high school education, high school up to college, you find that as you go up the, the ladder of education, people are actually more likely to be members of churches, more likely to go to churches, and no less likely to believe in God. It tails off as you go on to graduate training, and especially Ph.D. training, there is something about Ph.D. training that seems to attract irreligious people. And notice what I said. There's very little evidence that, a PhD, that Ph.D. training makes you irreligious. There's good evidence that people who are relatively irreligious or are, are more likely. Uh -huh, sure. Um, so that's, that's one it's bit like, of concrete I evidence. I assume that... There are other groups, for example, in our society where that's true. Journalists, for example, I don't know. I get the impression that journalists, I don't know if it's true, that journalists are less likely to be religious relative to the average American. I wouldn't want to argue, I assume you don't argue, if that's true, I assume it's not because journalists, uh, through the practice of journalism, suddenly see the light or the darkness and decide that, that, that God doesn't exist, but rather that... Journalism tends to attract people who, for whatever reason, are less likely to be believers. Is that true about journalists? Journalists are somewhat less likely to be religious than their counterparts in the rest of society. When I say counterparts, I think of equally educated people, equally mm -hmm. wealthy people. Academics tend to be less religious than their counterparts. Equally well-educated, 
uh, and equally wealthy business people, people in, in, in other forms of business tend to be a good deal more religious, people in uh, narrowly academic fields, uh, people who, who teach at universities, have PhDs, tend to be less religious than highly educated professionals, doctors and lawyers. Uh, doctors are, are, I think, thinking about the data here, more religious than most other highly educated people. I think lawyers perhaps a little bit less so. Economists are a little bit less. Anthropologists, psychologists turn out to be quite irreligious compared to other groups. Physical scientists, physicists, biologists, tend to be fairly religious compared to other professors, academics, researchers. Um, all of these differences, though, are relatively small. So uh, when we look at the general population, the most striking thing is that religious people are seen all across the educational spectrum. The people that we think of as religious conservatives, the dreaded members of the religious right, uh, the evangelicals in America have average levels of education that are almost indistinguishable from the general public at this point. Uh, that wasn't true 30, 40 years ago, but basically evangelicals have converged on the rest of the public. And since you raised the issue of atheism, I've got to get a little dig in here uh, to point out to my colleagues, some of whom are quite irreligious and rather proud of it, that the average atheist, the most sort of, if you had to just Guess the demographic profile of a person knowing nothing but that they were atheists. What you would want to guess, excuse me? Well, I was going to say, I think the, again, I think the stereotype is that they're highly educated, et cetera, et cetera, sophisticated, blah, blah, blah. Right. You know, True they're, or false. they're uh, intellectual, right. deep, and, you know, so it's, it's dead wrong. The group most likely to be atheistic are relatively young, single, males with low education and rather alienated socially and economically from the rest of society. So they tend not to be married, even though they may be in their late 20s or 30s. And they tend not to be very well off and they tend not to be very educated. And they're not very religious, perhaps in part because they're not very anything else. They're yeah. not well connected with society. Now, most of my good intellectual, and I mean good, I think they're good people and they're, they're good friends, uh, my good intellectual atheists don't particularly like those, those other types of atheists at all and don't think about them as representative of atheism in general. But I just got to say that if you just looked at the raw numbers, atheists on average are less educated than the general public. Atheists on average are less well off. And they probably, although I'm not sure I studied this carefully, they're probably more prejudiced and they have a good many negative attributes simply because atheists, uh, because a very large fraction of atheists, are these people who are very marginalized. They're not you know, intellectuals. Now, among the atheists who are intellectuals, I gotta get in another dude, and that is that they think of themselves as these bold individualists. Right. When you look at the most staunch atheists in this highly educated strata, you find people who are almost like cult members. And I'll give you one specific group, although I'm sure it's going to generate uh, some negative fan mail. Look at the followers of Ayn Rand, the objectivist. You have never seen a group that looks, or rather I should say, I have never seen a group whose social attributes are more consistent with what we call cults than the objectivists. And they are rapidly anti-religious. You said early on, let us speculate that atheists are people who just don't value uh, these collective goods. I think that's true of some atheists, but a good many other atheists, and especially those who are highly educated, I think are, without realizing, members of a rather devout club whose primary attribute is the negative attitudes it has toward people who believe in religion. And that, that negative attitude and that sense of superiority is exactly analogous to the attitudes that, uh, that cult members have. Cult members, the kinds that we tend to, to regard with suspicion, are convinced that they're right and everyone right. else is wrong, sure. that they are somehow fundamentally superior, and they have the knowledge that everyone else is lacking. Well, 
that's a pretty good description of, of um, some of the atheists I know, most of the objectivists I know. But they don't wear the unusual clothing and have funny haircuts. Oh, no, but they have very distinctive <laughs> ways of speaking. They True. have ways of confronting people in that essentially isolate themselves. Uh, you don't have to wear no, funny clothes. I think it's, it's an interesting point. I, I, I'm, um, there is a, a deep human desire to feel part of something that is larger than oneself. There are people who are devoid of that desire, but uh, there are many ways to produce it. Uh, intellectual cults are one way. Sports teams are another. Religions are a third, and I, I think they differ. All those differ by the vehicle by which that that feeling of group belonging is created. Um, I started this discussion by saying that the economics of religion was about using the insights and methods of economics to study the human side of religion. And by its very nature, that doesn't give you a lot of leverage on understanding the transcendent side of religion. But the advantage of this approach is that it generalizes rather rapidly to things that we wouldn't normally think of as religion at all. Because this need to be a part of a group, and because along with it this need or this desire to feel that your group is somehow better than all other groups, because that is so pervasive, the insights from the economics of religion adapt themselves readily to the attachment people feel in, to sports teams, the attachments that people feel and obtain from being part of political groups. Yeah. Uh, Parties, and, movements. Uh, that, exactly. And the attachments that people feel and that governments actively promote, that people feel uh, for their nation, and, and especially if they are for their military, if they are part of the military, to create a successful military unit, you have to create a kind of cult-like devotion, not just to some abstract notion of your country and freedom and this and that, but to the very small military unit that you're a part of. And the methods that are used in the military are strikingly similar to those that are used by so-called cults. We literally take these recruits in, we shave their head, we yep. make them wear uniforms, we impose all kinds of extraordinary costs goofy, on them. Goofy songs. Not <clears throat> all of which clearly are related to shooting better or right. being physically more adept. This is a human constant. And when somebody stands back from religion and treats it as it's, though it's weirdly different from everything else, I think we're, they're missing out on an important understanding of of what it is that makes us human, for good or ill, both yeah. the best and the worst. Obviously, that that group feeling can be harnessed for sublime or or uh, heinous uh, ends. That's why I use the military analogy. You know, you might be using it to defend yourself against the you know against people who are trying to battle all that it, that is good uh, in the world, or you might be using it to attack all that is good in the world. It it is a tool. And like all other tools, it can be put to very, to very different ends. Well, I think appreciating that and understanding it is a crucial endeavor. I, Larry, I want to thank you for joining us today. My guest today has been my colleague here at George Mason University, Larry Anacone. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can comment on this podcast, find links and readings related to today's topic. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of George Mason University. Thanks for listening.